Hello, fellow risk takers, and welcome to my worst investment ever. Stories of loss to keep you winning. My name is Andrew Stotts from A. Stotts Academy, and I'm here with featured guest, William Cohen. And William is a former guest on the show. He was episode 739. William is a former senior banker for 17 years in the area of M&A and is the New York Times bestselling author of seven nonfiction narratives, including his most recent book, Power Failure, The Rise and Fall of an American Idol. William, welcome back onto the show. Great to see you. Great to see you, Andrew. Thank you for having me back. Yeah, we had a few few backs and back and forth to get you back on with all the weather and all kinds of crazy things going on. So it's good to to have this discussion. Eclipses, earthquakes, monsoons. We've had it all here lately. Yeah, that's crazy. And I saw the news about the earthquake in the on the East Coast. I was like, what is going on? I felt it too. Felt it in my house. And the rafters were shaking. That's crazy. I mean, I remember moving from Ohio to California and LA feeling the earthquakes, but I never felt any, you know, when I lived on in Delaware or in in, uh, in Ohio. So the world is shaking. Not only is it on fire and burning, it's also shaking. Um, the reason why I wanted to get you back on and for the listeners out there is um, because uh, I, I went on Audible to get your book and it wasn't available at the time. I couldn't find the hard copy in Thailand. So I thought I'm just going to get it on Audible. And I think that this type of a book, a, a narrative, a nonfiction narrative is a fun book. Maybe also fiction books, you know, are fun to listen to uh, as opposed to sitting there and reading and kind of, I take notes and nonfiction type books. And uh, I'm holding the book up right here because I also found it in the bookstore in Bangkok. It's now come. So for those people that are looking for the book, you probably can find it in a bookstore near you if it's made it to Bangkok. But you can also find it on Audible on Amazon. And that's where I listen to it. But the key thing is that it was a 28, it's a 28 hour book. And I don't know about you, but for myself, when I see a book that's four hours, I like that. I'm like, I can deal with that. But when I see a book that's 28 hours, I'm really intimidated. And it's just like, I feel like that's 28 hours of my life. Do I really want to give that to this? But because I had met you and, and decided it's it's worth giving it a try. Um, the thing that I, the reason why I brought you back is because I can tell you and tell the audience that I was, it was riveting. I mean, every single day I had time in the day that I turned that on and I listened and it took me, you know, a couple of weeks to get through it, but I just found it absolutely fascinating. And so, first of all, I just want to congratulate you on that because how hard is that? <laughs> well, thank you. That's very nice. Uh, yeah, it's a lot of work. It's a lot of work. And so for, for the listeners out there, 28 hours uh, is about 750, 800 pages total, including notes and all of that. How long does it take to do something like that? Well, you know, it, I started it uh, before the pandemic, and then that hit, and I don't know whether that helped or hurt. I mean, I couldn't really couldn't couldn't really go anywhere, couldn't you know see anybody. So I guess that sort of made it, but I but made it more time on task, uh, fewer distractions. But I don't think I realized, uh, Andrew, quite what I had bitten off. Uh, you know, between all the interviewing I had to do and the research. I mean, the company was started in 1892 and I was writing about it till, you know, 2022. So, you know, that's, a, you know, 130 years. That's a lot of history to, to write. And of course, you know, you don't include everything. There were things that I put in that got cut out and it was still as long as it is. So, uh, you know, and it was such a, a fascinating uh, history. It's really the history of the 20th century, of course, and, and the history of, you know, America's uh, rise to prominence uh, in the 20th century. Uh, and, you know, incredibly, this company became, you know, the most valuable company in the world, the most, one of the most respected companies in the world, and then it kind of all fell apart. So not only did I have the great story of it being created, I also had the fascinating story of it, you know, falling apart. Literally. So, yeah. It's now in three separate pieces. 
uh, as of literally this week. Mm. And and maybe for the listeners out there that don't uh, that maybe they don't know about General Electric or they don't know about Jack uh, Welch as an example in inside the story, maybe you could just give a, an overview of of what what is the the overall story that they're going to get when they listen to this book when they buy this book and read this book you know it's 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 an american story that's one thing for sure uh but it's of also course, a story you know, of people did. i mean yeah and then it's a story of a company that then had facilities all over the world it became a global company uh but yeah i like to write my books about the people involved. I kind of focus on the movements of the people, uh, the backstories of the people, because, you know, I mean, you get a character like Jack Welch, uh, and that's like manna from heaven, uh, you know, because he's so sui generis and so interesting and, uh, you know, led this company when he, you know, took it over. It was a highly respected company, a leader you know, an American business and industry, uh, you know, it was a $12 billion market value company, which, you know, was probably a lot, uh, you know, in 1980, uh, 1981, when Jack took over and he, he, uh, you know, uh, through, you know, sort of relentless buying and selling of companies, uh, through relentless uh, focus on earnings and earnings growth, uh, and relentless focus on pleasing Wall Street and the Wall Street analysts and the media that covered Wall Street. He, um, you know, turned this, his company was worth $650 billion when he, uh, before, you know, in the year before he left. And uh, it was kind of the, you know, it was, it was, every, it was kind of the everything company. I mean, it was a technological leader. It was a leader in finance. It was a leader in media. It owned NBC. Uh, it made all the, you know, appliances that we take for granted. And uh, and it made, you know, the world's best gen jet engines and, and power plants. Plastic. Uh, so it, it, yeah, I mean, it, 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 uh, x-ray machines, MRIs. I mean, it did an amazing array of things, uh, sort of like if, if, kind of like uh, uh, Apple and Google and Microsoft uh, and Netflix and Amazon were kind of rolled up into one. Uh, that's the kind of company uh, we're dealing, uh, we were dealing with here. And, uh, and the guy who sort of brought it to the, you know, world uh, leadership, uh, world dominance almost w was this guy, Jack Welch. And, you know, if I think back to the younger, my younger years, conglomerates were all the rage. Right. And this is like the ultimate conglomerate. It right. wasn't like they were focused in on one product. You know, I think about Apple as an example. They, they focus in on kind of one product, the computer. And then later they added another product that connected with that product. So right. even though they were adding on a different product, they stayed within a very narrow focus and they still build a trillion dollar company, you know, amazing. But this is why GE is such an interesting story is how to bring together all of these different parts, you know, all of these different types of businesses. And I'm just curious, maybe we can take a look at Jack Welch's time as kind of the first theme of this and, you know, um, how was he able to do this? You know, I mean, I think a lot of CEOs out there and business leaders, they want to be able to do something like that. So how was he able to do that? Well, I think one of the reasons he was selected, uh, you know, um, among the uh, five candidates sort of vying uh, to become the CEO uh, in 1981 was because Sort of he was the youngest uh, and he was the most uh, potentially uh, the most disruptive. Uh, you know, he sort of had pledged to disrupt things, uh, to change uh, uh, the way uh, GE had been run. And that meant, um, you know, I, thought, I think he thought it had gotten too bloated, too bureaucratic, 
to flow, uh, uh, not uh, focused enough on quality and quality control. And so I think he, uh, you know, he adopted a lot of Japanese manufacturing techniques, Six Sigma. Uh, he, uh, uh, you know, made a big show of, of firing people who weren't uh, productive, the bottom 10%. You know, they called him Neutron Jack because, you know, he fired the people and left the building standing. Uh, and he and he basically changed uh, much about the composition of the conglomerate. You know, he he sold off uh, one business called uh, Utah International uh, that his predecessor uh, had bought. And it was like a two billion dollar uh, M&A deal. It was a commodity. It was a mining company in in the Western U.S. Uh, and uh, Jack didn't like commodities. And this had been, you know, the the biggest M and A deal in history when it was bought uh, by his predecessor, Reg Jones. And uh, uh, Jack was against doing that deal, but he was powerless to stop it. So one of the first things he did when he took over as CEO is he sold off. Uh, Utah International, uh, so got rid of this sort of commodity mining business. Um, and then the next thing uh, he did, Andrew, was uh, uh, he bought RCA, uh, which was itself a mini conglomerate, uh, manufactured TVs, uh, owned NBC, owned radio stations, owned TV stations, uh, and, uh, you know, made uh, defense systems and radar systems. And, uh, you know, he swapped out a variety of different assets uh, with uh, Thompson in, in France, uh, gave, shipped off the uh, uh, TV manufacturing business to them, and in return got a lot of healthcare device uh, companies, uh, you know, and that helped build up GE's healthcare uh uh, manufacturing uh, device like the x-rays and the MRIs and all of those machines, uh, again, that we uh, take for granted now. Uh, and so he, you know, he, he built that up and then NBC became uh, an important part of the company. He built that up. Uh, and of course, you know, he transformed GE Capital from being uh, a company, a part of the business that helped finance uh, customer purchases of uh, GE appliances and GE equipment uh, into you know this the, the third uh, or fourth largest uh, uh, financial services company uh, in the country, and it ended up uh, you know it it, it was able to uh, borrow very cheaply in the commercial paper market because of GE's AAA credit rating. And he essentially arbitraged uh, that cost of capital and then lent out the money at large spreads and, you know, was making huge profits. Um, you know, almost 50% of the company's profits were now coming from this non-bank bank, this unregulated bank. Mm -hmm. and, and most people had no idea, uh, you know, what he was up to. And that's sort of in addition to growing the, you know, aircraft engine business and the power supply business. So, uh, you know, he he really was a master uh, allocator of capital and a master uh, motivator. Uh, he, he also uh, uh, really revamped uh, GE's uh, management uh, development uh, program that was at uh, a Crotonville, which was a a, a center that he built on the Hudson River. Um, so uh, he uh, was really, frankly, uh, an amazing leader. Uh, people love working for him. Uh, and he got more out of people than they thought possible. Uh, and then the, so the combination of that, the never ending, you know, the, the increasing earnings, uh, the fact that the media loved him and the research analysts uh, loved him, it was it was powerful. Extremely, extremely powerful. And, and I don't really think there's anybody quite like that today, you know, across so many, you know, industries, uh, 
you know, if, if I suppose if if Jeff Bezos or Elon Musk were were beloved instead of like not really liked and mm. not really, you know, people wonder, you know, about their leadership qualities and their how responsible they are. I mean, Musk obviously more than Bezos, uh, but you know, Jack was sort of beloved, feared, respected, uh, and delivered. Um, <clears throat> so first um, lesson that I took away as I was listening to the book and as I listened to you talk is that he struck very fast. He was like fast and deep right off, right out of the gates. And I was surprised about how aggressive, you know, that, that even the board let him be and that he was, um, <clears throat> is it, is it accurate to say that he's, that he really strike fast and deep. Well, yeah. Again, he was the reason he got the job. Was he was uh, sort of in addition to being a master politician, um, uh, he was he was the youngest. He was probably the most different than Reg Jones, who was a sort of a, a patrician Brit uh, who moved to the U.S. Um, uh, you know, Jack was an only child from outside of Boston, spoke with a heavy, uh, you know, Boston area accent. Uh, uh, and but he was hired not only because of his youth and his energy, uh, but but, you know, he was going to be this change agent. There was no doubt about it. And, you know, I don't think Reg thought he had, you know, made mistakes or anything, but, uh, you know, GE would go through these phases, uh, uh, you know, when it was tr trying to be lean and then it would get too bureaucratic. And then, you know, you had to have somebody come in there and sort of get out the deadwood. Mm -hmm. uh, and Jack, you know, Jack, Jack aspired to this. Jack wanted this job. And so, you know, when you want something and you think you're the right guy, for the job and then you get the job then you you know you don't not going to waste any time you know what you're doing and you get right to it and uh you know that's what jack did and i guess by that time at 80 in 81 he had been at the company for what was it 20 oh, like 20 years you know yeah. he's like from the early 60s so he already understood the company very well and what you've just described is given he... more and more responsibility along the way you know which is the way they did it they would sort of expand your world view to see if you could handle more and more responsibility and of course he he did at every every time he was given more responsibility he was able to handle it well and and then the last part of this is that he was the mandate was from the board and i guess you could say from the shareholders if it's coming from the board was to you know make serious positive change so he he had the mandate to move fast and he did move fast one of the questions, so just just want to continue on for just a bit on on his management, and you know, uh, there's another a, a management guru, different from a manager, <laughs> uh, Dr. Deming, who came of age during that time, uh, came, became popular. His book Out of the Crisis came out in 1996, and he had already been helping the Japanese. He had come back. He was trying to help Ford. He was trying to help American industry. And he had a really, one of his 14 points was drive out fear in the organization. That fear is what's holding uh, many companies back. Workers aren't going to take a risk because they fear. And when you think about Jack Welch's, uh, you know, tenure, I think fear, fear, fear. I mean, if I was working for him, I would be intimidated i would be scared i would be worried you know there's like public executions and like there is fear is an important element of his style and i'm just curious uh how do you see the 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 the, the two sides of that um debate or discussion or idea about you know the using fear in management well it, well, it, well you know it, there was both love uh and respect and fear yes uh, well, you know, fear that uh, somehow if you didn't deliver for him uh, the earnings that he wanted you to deliver, 
uh, he wasn't going to uh, put up with that for very long. Uh, it wasn't going to be immediate firing, but if you didn't get your act together, he wasn't going to wait and give you a whole bunch of chances. Again, he was, you know, he uh, uh, told you what he expected of you to do, uh, and he expected you to deliver uh, what he asked you to do. Uh, but he also uh, encouraged dissent, which, you know, a lot of people, organizations are fearful because people are afraid to speak up. People are afraid to dissent. People are to share what afraid to share what they really think, because you know there'll be consequences uh, for their career. And um, I think Jack uh, could be persuaded. Uh, you know, he was whip smart, but I also think he uh, would uh, ha allow uh, his mind to be changed. And there were plenty of examples uh, where his uh, mind was uh, changed. I think uh, one of those examples was uh, some sort of uh, was a, a billion dollar uh, a loan they were talking about making to a company in Thailand that was the biggest rental car company or something yep. in Thailand. Yep. And uh, Jack was completely against the idea, but then he had his mind changed and uh, they made that loan and they made a lot of money. Uh, so um, I think it was a, a very much a meritocracy. Um, uh, I don't think, uh, you know, he didn't matter that much. I mean, he liked the Ivy League uh, graduates, don't get me wrong, because Jack uh, was not an Ivy League uh, graduate. I think he, uh, I mean, one of the reasons he, I think gravitated towards Jeff Immelt was because Jeff Immelt had gone to Dartmouth and Harvard Business School. Uh, you know, Jack went to UMass and got his PhD from the University of Illinois. Uh, uh, but I think it was a real meritocracy too. I mean, I think he mm. um, he just wanted to have smart people around him and encouraged uh, people who were smart and who could deliver, uh, he really uh, uh, promoted the hell out of those guys. You just get this feeling as I was listening, you know, and going through it, it's like he's a, he's a baseball player and then he becomes a baseball coach and he just loves the game. He just loves it. And he loves the players and he loves the action. He loves the competition. And he just gonna, until his dying breath, He's just going to want to be in that game and competing. That's the way I felt, you know, when I was, you know, thinking about him. Well, I mean, think about how great would it be to, you know, be the CEO of the most, one of the most powerful companies, uh, you know, on earth. Uh, you know, I don't think there was a hardly a country he could go to where there wasn't a GE plant or facility or office or something, you know, the most valuable company in the world, the most respected you know, if he, if he, you know, he could get access to presidents and prime ministers and, uh, you know, dictators. I mean, you know, you know people sought him out. Uh, the media, the, you know, the research community, Wall Street, bankers were fawning over. You know, you know, it's hard not to like that. You're flying around the world in corporate jets. You know, you're living the imperial lifestyle. Everybody's hanging on your very word. You know, you command an army of, you know, 200,000 people. Uh, and, uh, you know, what you say, you know, goes. Mm. Uh, you know, why wouldn't you enjoy that? Yeah. Um, I I just talked about the GE Capital deal in Thailand. Basically, in 1997, Thailand went bust. And uh, we had 55% non-performing loans in the banking system and the Ministry of Finance ended up shutting down, you know, a large number of banks and many brokers and other financial institutions. And there was billions of dollars of bad loans that they, they auctioned off. And, um, you know, it was mainly foreign players that came in to buy those. Uh, but what was auctioned off 
uh, GE Capital, the people, and I, I think I want to get the guys that were involved in it here on the ground in Thailand to talk about that later. But the in this case, you know, they they invested maybe close to a billion dollars in auto loans and those types of loans. And then they just worked that out and they made great money from that deal over a, a long time. And so they brought, you know, capital into the country when really, I remember at that time, I was in the stock market and, you know, the country was just, you know, in an awful situation, the GDP had collapsed by 11% in 1998. And that that's when the, when they saw the opportunity to, to buy. So just, that's a little background on that. Um, what, what I'm also thinking about um, is should a young person build their, uh, a young person that wants to be a successful manager, should they model themselves off of Jack Welch? Well, that's that's a tough uh, a question to to know how to answer. I mean, everybody is different. You can, you know, uh, you know, I I can model myself after LeBron James, but you know, <laughs> I just don't have the, the skill set uh, or any any reason to believe that I would ever end up being uh, anything remotely like him. Uh, you know, so is Jack Welch is kind of the uh, LeBron James of, 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 you know, corporate, corporate CEO types. I mean, you know, uh, do you, do you have what that takes? I mean, first of all, uh, Andrew, as, as you know, I mean, how in the world do you, you know, weave your way, uh, and, uh, organize your life in such a way that you can get to the top of this kind of an organization and even be, uh, you know, considered to be the CEO, let alone get the job. I mean, uh, how do you maneuver your way through uh, the corporate uh, maze, uh, you know, year after year after year and get yourself in a position to to be considered uh, for that kind of job, let alone get it and then do a great job once you get that responsibility. Uh, so, uh, I, you know, I don't know how, you, you know, we can sit here and talk about, you know, modeling, you know, young people modeling themselves after, after Jack Welch. I, I just don't know that that's a useful concept, but, but I think that uh, people, uh, you know, I, I think if you do the basic blocking and tackling uh, that Jack Welch did, uh, which is, you know, uh, be, you know, you know, be super achievement oriented, do, do a super good job, uh, you know, take every assignment that you're given and do a fabulous job at it, be politic, right? Be, be you know, uh, be able to, you know, uh, you know, kissing up and sucking up is a, a real art form and uh, uh, to be able to do that well. And I'm not saying Jack did that well, but he, Jack uh, had rabbis, uh, you know, I think, as I tell the story in the book, uh, I mean, after his first year there, um, he was in the plastics division, uh, and uh, for whatever reason, there were, you know, four or five guys in that division, all sort of young guys, and and uh, uh, whatever the decision was made to pay them all the same, uh, and Jack just was so offended by that, because he thought he was much better than the other uh, his other uh, colleagues, and so he 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 quit. He actually got a job at uh, a a, com a company in the Midwest uh, in Chicago, I think, and was getting ready to move. And um, you know, his boss's boss called him up and basically said, you know, essentially, you know, don't don't leave. I'll take care of you. You know, you don't have to worry about your boss anymore. Uh, I'll I'll be your rabbi, and you know, he stayed. He got a bigger a compensation, uh, and he had a rabbi in the corporate office who took care of him. I mean, how, how do you how do you pull that off? Mm. Uh, you know, it's really kind of an, an innate, you know, an innate art form and innate skill to be able to you know weave your way in in these corporate mazes and. Uh, and succeed and you know come well, out and hats off to that guy for identifying 
that this is a key strength in this company and we can't let him leave. You know, that's also an art form. Um, there's a there's a parallel here that I was thinking about, and that is there's another asset allocator, let's say, or capital allocator out there that started roughly, let's say, the same time as Jack Welch. And he started with a company that was roughly the same size, about 10 million or so at the time. And, and that capital allocator has now built that company up to about 900 billion. So if you take that back to the term when Jack Welch was head of uh, of GE at 650 billion, maybe in those dollars, it's almost exactly the same. And that's Warren Buffett and Berkshire Hathaway. He did it by, you know, he did it by a very different route, but the increase in market capitalization was pretty much the same. And I'm curious, you know, when I think about Jack Welch and his capital allocation, you know, he definitely wasn't like an all numbers guy. He wasn't like he was a finance guy and the numbers got to line up. He, 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 he had to have vision to see how these different parts would work together with his acquisitions and his divestures. And when I think about Buffett, he's also a visionary guy of thinking about what's the future potential for this particular business, let's say Coca-Cola as an example. He liked the simplicity of it, you know, and, and all that. I'm just curious if if we were to 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 look at those two people, what is your what are your thoughts about that? You know, the differences or similarities of what it takes to take a company from 10 million to 650 billion. Well, you know, Warren Warren Buffett uh, is obviously a legendary uh, figure. He's he's an investor, though he's uh, he uh, uh, you know has identifies companies that have characteristics that he likes and he thinks will be a long time success. Uh, and he's basically been pretty right most of the time, and he invests in those companies. Uh, and then he also buys companies, uh, but uh, and then you know keeps the management and leaves them alone. Uh, you know, Jack was part that, but also you know an operational guy. You know, he 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 ran businesses. He managed people. I mean, Warren Buffett doesn't manage anybody he manages mm -hmm. you know the 10 people in his office or whatever <laughs> uh, but but he doesn't manage the hundreds of thousands of people who work in the companies that he owns or has big stakes in right he, he has no it's a quiet big, life yeah he's a quiet life that has made him a hundred billion dollars and uh you know it's a different uh different different strategy uh completely uh you know, so Jack uh, was is an operations guy uh, and, and managed people. Uh, so very, very different skill set, very different approach, very different business plan. Uh, I'm I'm sure uh, a Warren Buffett's life is a lot less stressful than Jack <laughs> Welch's life, which may explain why. You know, Warren is whatever, 92 or three now and still at it. Yeah. And I guess it also shows kind of different strokes for different folks um, that, you know, people followed the path that, that works for them. Let's talk now about the second theme of this, which is the transition uh, from uh, the second theme of this the conversation, not necessarily the book, which has many themes. But clearly there was a, you know, the transition from Jack Welch to to Jeff, Jeff M Emmelt. Uh, was a key point, a turning point for GE. And maybe you could just describe briefly, you know, what what that process was like. And then we'll also talk a little bit about Jeff and then try to, you know, draw some conclusions from that. I, I'll try to draw some conclusions. I know, you know, you, I, what I like about what you said earlier to me when we before we turn on the recording is like, you draw your own conclusions. I'm not here to necessarily you know, say the exact conclusions, but I'm I'm here to set the stage so that, you know, you can think about it or you can just enjoy the story. Yeah, I mean, uh, the, 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 it was a very, very public uh, succession process, uh, you know, to succeed Jack Welch, as you can imagine. I mean, uh, you know, the most 
admired CEO uh, you know, on the planet has been in the seat for 20 years and he's going to pick his successor. And so, uh, you know, the competition was uh, keen. It was narrowed down to three guys, uh, Immelt, uh, uh, Nardelli, Bob Nardelli, uh, and Jim uh, McInerney. And, um, you know, Jack decided that whoever the two losers are, they'd have to leave the company. Uh, you know, they were, uh, uh, he also uh, made the decision, uh, which was different than uh, he had experienced. He, he made the decision, you know, they were each running different parts of the business. You know, Nardelli was running the power business and McInerney was running the jet engine business and, and Immelt was running the healthcare uh, machine business. Uh, and, you know, they were in different locations around the country because that's where these businesses were located. And instead of, uh, uh, you know, bringing them to Fairfield, Connecticut, which is where G's headquarters was at the time, uh, now it's in Boston and, you know, actually, who knows where it is now because they don't really have a central uh, location anymore, uh, being three separate companies. Uh, uh, you know, he kept them out in their in the field, in their locations uh, and didn't bring them to Fairfield. Uh, one thing he didn't like about his own succession process is that Reg Jones brought everybody uh, to Fairfield, Connecticut. Uh, you know, the five people competing. And for two years, you know, they had to look at each other in the hallway, uh, you know, and see who they were competing with. And, you know, Jack didn't like that because he just thought it was a ridiculous amount of politicking. Uh, but it was great for Reg Jones because he could see, you know, who was, uh, you know, on a day-to-day -day basis, you can really tell what people were like. Well, Jack didn't want to do that because he didn't like that. So he kept these people out in the field. And so he would see them like, you know, once a month when they would come to like the G capital board meeting or they would come to review their budgets with him or review what uh, they, you know, they didn't do right or to review, you know, how much, what bonuses they were going to pay people. Uh, and so, uh, you know, uh, when they would come and see him like, you know, once a month or once every two months, they'd be, you know, uh, they'd be politicking the whole time. So so it became a, a contest really to see who was the best politician, not who was the best me manager and the best leader and the best businessman. Uh, uh, but, you know, ja and Jack thought, oh, well, uh, that's, so that's one thing he did differently. And then he, he, he you know, one day in the shower, he, told me he came up with this great idea that uh, he would, uh, at each of the businesses for these three guys, uh, he would uh, name a chief operating officer, in a sense, a successor to this person, so that if they lost the job, because uh, two out of the three were going to obviously lose the job, uh, uh, then they, left, they would have to leave the company, their successor would be named and already in place, and it would sort of be a seamless uh, uh, operation. And so he was pleased with himself for doing that. So, you know, he had the guy running for uh, 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 CEO and then, you know, this number two guy as the COO. And, uh, uh, you know, long story short, uh, Jeff uh, Immelt, uh, Dartmouth and uh, Harvard Business School was a better uh, politician than Jim McInerney and Bob Nardelli. Uh, and so uh, when Jack made that decision i think he uh he had no doubt he'd made the right decision he thought he had made the right decision um and of course there was a lot of fanfare and a lot of uh you know high-fiving all around uh but uh you know soon enough jack uh uh, uh soured on jeff immelt and mm. you know jeff immelt ended up staying for 17 years and having a huge effect on the company and I guess a takeaway that I got from that part of the story was the idea that if you if you're kind of elbow to elbow with somebody on a day to day basis, you're going to see their faults. 
you're going to see their insecurities, you're going to see the problems. And by and so therefore, if you're working on a successor, one possibility that could make it so that you're more likely to be successful in that is that you try to get as close to that person for as long of a time as you can, so that you really more deeply understand them as opposed to just, you know, uh, holding court for them to come and, you know, present themselves with their latest, you know, stuff. W would you think that that, that would be a, a, a good conclusion to draw from that? Well, ab absolutely. I think uh, mm -hmm. Jack didn't like it, but I think Reg Jones had the right process for succession, uh, not, not Jack. Uh, and, you know, Jack, I think, would be the first to admit, as he was to me, uh, well, the first thing he said to me, even before I sat down for our first interview, was that he had screwed up this selection process of his successor. Uh, first thing out of his mouth. And, uh, you know, I was pretty much incredulous because, uh, Jack, this is, uh, uh, this is your main responsibility as the CEO. You know, you, you could do, you could do all these great deals. You could buy RCA, you could, you know, buy, you know, swap with Thompson. You could try to buy, uh, uh, you know, other, other companies, uh, you know, but if you screw up the choice of your successor, you've, you've blown a hole in the organization. Yeah. And it's, and um, so, it, it's something like, uh, when, when I think about it, I think it's, it's, you know, it's not a common thing, but on the other hand, he was picking successors of many businesses, you know, all the time. Totally. <laughs> he, he was, he was allocating financial capital and he was allocating human capital. That yeah. was his job. Yeah. So my, my last question on this point, and then we'll talk about Jeff Emmel is, uh, what role did the board play in this process and what do you think you know could the board have you know is the board just a tool of the ceo and therefore they're not going to provide much dissent or should the board have been involved in a different way or what are your thoughts about the relationship between the ceo and the board there yeah it's a good question uh you know being on the ge board was very prestigious sort of the pinnacle of capitalism. Um, so, you know, who got chosen for that board was people who had succeeded as CEOs uh, or, or academics uh, uh, in other uh, areas. And so, you know, first of all, the tendency in sort of a board-like setting, somewhat of a group think-like setting is, you know, is now, you know, is not to rock the boat uh, not to not to be a nail that sticks up because then you get bashed down. Uh, uh, but you know, I don't think Jack was like that. Uh, I think Jack, as I said, you know, encouraged people to speak up. But you know, these these board meetings were all very orchestrated. Uh, even if they had board meetings once a month, you know, these board members have other things to do the rest of the month. They show up. They get wine and dine. They get taken around to facilities, the agendas set, the board books set, you know, maybe there's some discussion about uh, an acquisition or, or divestiture that, uh, you know, Jack wanted to make, but, uh, you know, it was all kind of gamed out in advance. Mm. Um, uh, you know, clearly the board was aware of the succession process and the candidates and had a role in vetting them. But, but I really feel like, uh, you know, Jack was also uh, not only the CEO, he was chairman of the board, too. So, uh, and that's pretty much the way it is over here, uh, mm -hmm. generally speaking. And uh, so, you know, generally speaking, what the CEO wants, the CEO gets. The CEO wants Jeff Immelt, you know. There was some dissension on the board about Jeff Immelt, but it didn't amount to much. Mm. It wasn't enough to win the day. Uh, and then when Jeff Immelt became the CEO, you know, board members who actively were dissenters, uh, like, you know, Ken, Ken Langone mm. uh, or Sandy uh, Warner, who was the uh, head of J.P. Morgan, uh, uh, Jeff actually 
kick them off the board. And, and so, uh, you know, what does that do? That, uh, you know, is like, uh, as as uh, uh, Voltaire wrote in Candide about the British general who came back uh, uh, to, to, to the UK after losing a battle in France, you know, and they, he got, and they killed him, you know, pour faire an exemple pour les autres, you know, you know, getting rid of Ken Langone, you know, who was the founder of Home Depot uh, and, a, and a wealthy investor, get, getting rid of Sandy Warner, the CEO of J.P. Morgan, uh, you know, and it was J.P. Morgan, the man who helped create J GE in the first place by insisting on the merger between Thomas Edison's company and Charles Coffin's company. Uh, to get rid of the CEO of J.P. Morgan from your board because he was dissented from something, you know, he didn't want uh, uh, the, uh, uh, you know, he wanted a different successor mm -hmm. uh, to Jeff Immelt than Jeff Immelt wanted, you know, that sends a very powerful message about the dangers of dissent. Uh, and, you know, if you're squelching dissent among your own board members you can imagine what's happening you know in the rest of the organization what what is the translation in english of what you said that voltaire said what what was how would you how does that translate in english uh it translates into to make an example for the others <laughs> so you it's a public you know, execution general, scare the crap out of everybody scare the crap out of everybody and you better you know, win. lose the battle don't bother trying right. to come home <laughs> um so let's just talk briefly about jeff emil and uh and just you know okay if i look at it from his side of the story hey i got this company it was in trouble it was wound so tight because of jack welch's style ge capital was you know was we shouldn't have been doing this or whatever and you know i had to I was, you know, hit in the face with all of this plus external factors. And therefore, you know, I was just the unlucky one that landed in that situation. I'm not saying that that's his point, but that I'm, I'm constructing that argument. Um, what if, if you were to completely take Jeff Emmelt's um, position or side, what would be some strong arguments as to why he, 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 he just he couldn't get it right? Besides the fact that he could have been just the wrong guy at the wrong place at the wrong time. Well, the first thing that uh, I would say if I were Jeff Immelt, and uh, he said um, many of these things to me, uh, uh, w w was that I took over my first day in the job uh, was, uh, you know, September 10th, 2001. My second day on the job, and, and then, I, you know, I made an announcement, you know, I, I had a, like a town meeting uh, for the employees. And then I flew to Seattle that day, that night, because I had a meeting with the CEO of Boeing the next morning, which was September 11th. So here he is in Seattle, about to have a meeting uh, with the CEO of Boeing, you know, who's got to be G one of GE's biggest customers, right? And GE, one of Boeing's biggest suppliers, uh, and he's on the stairmaster, and you know, at uh, you know six whatever in the morning, uh, Seattle time, and or five forty five whatever, and you know he's uh, watching uh, what's going on in downtown Manhattan, uh, and uh, you know GE made the jet engines on the planes. Uh, they had uh, reinsured uh, several of the buildings through their insurance unit uh, down uh, at the World Trade Center. They owned NBC, uh, which went, uh, uh, you know, ad free for a week. They had two or three people who were killed uh, who worked at GE. So, and, and of course, you know, the world changed dramatically uh, after 9 11. Uh, also, that was a time of uh, a lot of accounting scandals, uh, mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know, in, in corporate America and the passage of the 
uh, Sarbanes-Oxley uh, law that uh, made uh, the CEO and the CFO personally liable uh, for the financial statements. So uh, a lot of uh, things that Jack did and sort of got away with and, you know, the sort of jujitsu that he engaged in with Wall Street was now uh, kind of against the law or, you know, frowned upon. Uh, and, you know, basically he, he uh, needed, uh, you know, a big reset. Uh, and, and, and he and I talked about this um, hmm. a lot about why he didn't do a reset, why he didn't say to Wall Street, look, you know, I know we're trading it like a 50 times PE ratio, but we're really just as kind of a, that's way too high. Uh, you know, now it's after 9-11. We're really just a manufacturing company. It's going to be a lot slower growth. We're not going to be, a, you know, a, a 50 PE company. So why don't we do a reset? You take us down, our stock will trade down, but you know, then we'll have sort of a, a modest uh, but accurate kind of growth uh, pattern uh, from here on out. Now, I understand why that's incredibly difficult to do. Mm -hmm. Nobody wants to take a stock, you know, that's trading at a 50 PE and then trading at a 25 PE because the stock will, you know, trade in half and everybody will be really pissed at him. Better to, you know, keep up the facade that, you know, we're still the great company we were when Jack Welch ran it. And so I think that's sort of what uh, he, he did. Uh, you know, he could also say, that you know, Jack uh, Welch left him a bag of uh, a bag of bones uh, instead of Jack. What Jack says is, "I left you a royal flush, uh, and you played the hand poorly." Uh, Jeff Immelt could say, "Yeah, you you left me kind of a you know a couple of pairs, and I you know I played the best hand I could." Um, but you know, uh, and I know I, I suspect you're going to ask me, you know, was it? Was it you know sort of Jeff Welch, uh, Jeff Immelt's, uh, you know if 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 Jeff Immelt hadn't been the CEO, would the story have come out differently? Uh, and I I thought about this a lot, and and uh, you know I think as I said, you know the the selection of the CEO is uh, the most important decision uh, the 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 outgoing CEO can make. Uh, the selection of the CEO. Uh, makes all the difference, uh, you know, uh, you know, Jeff Immelt for all of his, uh, you know, uh, uh, appearance of being a CEO out of central casting, he really didn't understand uh, uh, finance uh, that well. Uh, he didn't understand G capital. Uh, I think, you know, you, you know, when you're uh, uh, running the third largest non-bank financial institution in you know in the country, maybe even the world, um, and you don't understand the dangers of borrowing short and lending long, the dangers of borrowing in the commercial paper market, which is like a thirty-day liability, uh, and lending out, you know, seven to ten years, you know, which becomes you know seven to ten year assets. You know, if there's something happens, uh, you know, and dries up your source of capital, you you know, you're you're toast. Mm -hmm. uh, and I don't think he really understood uh, the risks uh, that were inherent in uh, a banking business. Yeah, uh, banking business is incredibly risky, and people tend to forget how risky it is. Uh, so, you know, and you know, I I think a lot about what. Uh, Dave Calhoun told me, Dave Calhoun, who was a longtime GE executive who left and went to the Blackstone Group for a little while, and then uh, he was on the board of Boeing, and then he became the CEO of Boeing and just recently announced he was going to leave as CEO at the end of this year. Uh, I interviewed him when he was at Blackstone after he had left GE, but before he had gone to Boeing, and he told me something that... Um, still resonates with me uh, and, you know, kind of hate to say it, but I think it does some things up well, which is that when Jack Welch had uh, uh, big decisions to make, he made the right decisions by and large. And when Jeff Immelt had big decisions to make, he made the wrong decisions by and large. Mm. 
Um, one one last question I I had for you was, um, you know, you introduce a lot of different characters in the story, and I'm just curious, like, is there any particular character, like you mentioned Charles Coffin as an example, but is there any particular character that you really enjoyed learning about, or you would have liked, like, the, out of all of them, if you could have gone back in time to interview that particular person, who would that have been in the story? Well, you know, obviously Jack is like the greatest character and I did get to interview him, but uh, one of, uh, uh, you know, Jack's predecessors back at the 100 years ago was a guy named Owen Young, who was from upstate New York and was an incredibly gifted uh, lawyer uh, and, you know, eventually, you know, was urged to run for president. Uh, you know, he was a fascinating character. I, I had no idea uh, anything about him. Uh, I'd never heard of him before. Uh, but, you know, uh, and, and, and most of what I wrote about him got cut out, but uh, I thought he was a fascinating uh, character, really uh, an admirable guy, uh, uh, disciplined, uh, determined, uh, righteous, uh, principled, uh, you know, I thought, wow, uh, he's truly an amazing uh, leader. Um, but I think that, um, you know, pretty much all of the, the irony is that pretty much all of the GE leaders uh, before Imult had done a pretty, pretty good job. It's amazing. Yeah. And, you know, as Jack said, Imult had a you know, a, a decent, a decent to good seven year run until the financial crisis. Mm -hmm. And then it kind of all fell apart because he didn't understand the risks of G capital. And then he, you know, uh, uh, he managed to make it through that crisis. Uh, you know, G capital was uh, uh, prepared to file for bankruptcy twice, got bailed out by the treasury and the FDIC. Uh, uh, and, you know, after that, Jeff kind of freaked out. Uh, he, you know, sold NBC Universal to Comcast mm -hmm. too cheaply because he mm -hmm. wanted to be able to sell a company quickly uh, and get cash. He, uh, you know, uh, GE Capital became a SIFI, a systemically important financial institution, now regulated by the Fed. He didn't like the Fed regulation thought it was costing them $2 billion a year too much. He didn't like the Fed telling him what to do. He decided he would sell uh, GE Capital, um, you know, and that was, you know, generating 50% or 40% of the earnings and he had nothing really to replace it with. You know, then he overpaid for Alstom's power business and then he brought in Nelson Peltz, the hedge fund manager thinking, Nelson Peltz would ratify his brilliance, uh, you know, in selling GE Capital and redeploying the capital from GE Capital into other things. And, you know, it just compounded uh, itself until finally, you know, the stock was going down. Uh, there were these hidden liabilities uh, and, uh, you know, Nelson Peltz, you know, basically fired Jeff Immelt. And how is how is someone to feel about the rise and such a dramatic fall of a iconic, in you know, I, I wouldn't say institution, but an iconic accomplishment of capitalism, and then to see it collapse like that and then break, um, how how should we or how how do you process that? No, I think you know, Heraclitus I think said uh, all is flux. And then, uh, you know, Joseph Schumpeter, the great economist, talked about, you know, uh, creative destruction. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, companies are sort of like sharks. You know, they have to keep moving forward or else they die. Uh, you know, you have to keep reinventing yourself. You have to keep looking, being able to see around corners. Uh, 
you know, uh, you know, what, 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 you know, okay, so there's no more GE, but there, there's still parts of GE, right? I mean, uh, the, the, the GE appliance business still actually has the GE, uh, name on it, even though it's owned by, uh, Hayer, a Chinese company, mm. uh, GE plastics, I think is owned by the Saudis, uh, uh, you know, G capital is dispersed into all sorts of different other financial institutions. Uh, uh, and now, and, and, you know, now there's, you know, uh, three separate GE named companies, uh, GE Healthcare, uh, GE Vernova, which is the power business, the original business of the company and, and GE Aircraft, which is the jet engine business. So, uh, and I think together those companies are probably worth, you know, whatever, 225 billion. So not mm -hmm. 650 billion. Um, you know, it'll probably never uh, achieve what it had achieved under Jack. But, um, you know, so, and I think that's what happens. You know, a lot of companies get put together, you know, conglomerates are in fashion, then conglomerates are no longer in fashion fashion you know investment bankers get paid to put them together investment bankers get paid to put, <laughs> pull them apart you know the investment bankers always make money and the the assets are still floating around uh there uh you know it's just a question of who owns them where they are whether they're up whether they're down you know it's like what i, I like to say you know uh you know after 2008 the fed basically uh moved risk uh, a lot of the risk off the balance sheets of the big Wall Street banks, but you know, risk doesn't just disappear because it's no longer on the balance sheets of the big Wall Street banks. It it goes somewhere else. Yeah, there there still is risk. Uh, you know, it's it's in the shadow banking system. It's in the you know insurance industry. It's in the commercial uh, real estate business. Mm. Risk is all around, and it may not be on the bank on the Wall Street bank anymore, but it's still out there. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's a company, uh, an, another company with General at the beginning of it that I used to argue when I was young that they should let it go bust, and and that it's not when General uh, Motors has had so many different troubles over the years. I've always just thought let it break up. It's not going to completely disappear. The assets, the technology, if there's innovation and all that, that's going to be acquired and that's going to be used. But to constantly try to hold a company together, uh, you know, at some point just, you know, destroys value over the, over time. And so um, have, have you had, had any, com could, could you compare General Electric to General Motors, which I would argue has had a lot of government help and support to keep it together? Well, of course, General Motors went bankrupt uh, to get rid of its long-term health care liabilities, its pension liabilities. Uh, it's essentially got a fresh start. Uh, you know, GE Capital and GE did not go bankrupt. It was on the verge of going bankrupt, didn't go bankrupt. Uh, that would have, you know, given GE a fresh start. Uh, and that's probably why you know, GE was broken up now and GM uh, really wasn't because GM had the ability to cleanse itself through bankruptcy, which GE didn't have. Uh, you know, uh, people like to talk about, you know, the conglomerate uh, model being out of favor now. I think that's by and large true, but not completely true. I mean, uh, there are plenty of, I mean, what's, what's Microsoft now? I mean, it's, we don't think of it as a conglomerate, but it's hmm. got a big cloud business. It's got a big gaming business. It's got a big software business. It's got a big AI business. Amazon, you know, has a movie studio. It's, a, you know, you know, store of the world. It's got a big cloud service business. Uh, you know, so there are, conglomerates but this aren't called conglomerates anymore because 
Nobody likes that word anymore. And then there's companies like Danaher, which uh, is where the current CEO of GE came from, Larry Culp. I mean, that's a, a, got a market cap the last time I checked that was bigger than GE's. And, you know, it was once smaller than GE, much smaller. And, and that's a conglomerate. Uh, so, you know, uh, the, the name has become, a, 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 you know, a bad word, but I think it's still out there and sometimes it works and sometimes it doesn't. And again, it, it comes down to how it's managed. You know, Warren Buffett clearly runs a, some kind of conglomerate, mm. right? Uh, and he, you know, his model works beautifully. We love it. Uh, Danaher's works beautifully. We love it. Uh, Microsoft uh, works beautifully. You know, we, you know, Meta, they work, mm. you know, GE, you know, they had the wrong leader at the wrong time. He made the wrong decisions and we don't like it anymore. And the consequences of that is it should be broken up. Um, for the 28 hours that I was listening, I thought to myself, how many hours did it take you to create these 28 hours worth of listening or 750 or 800 pages of a book? Very hard work. Uh, yeah. And I do it all myself. Um, and uh, what can I tell you? It takes a lot of work. It's nice to see it there. It's nice to be able to talk about it. It's nice that people appreciate it. Uh, uh, you know, I'm you may be getting a little too old for this now. It's very hard to see if I can, you know, keep doing it. it seems to take longer and longer each time. Um, but, you know, I'll tell you this, it's very intellectually satisfying. Uh, it's uh, It's creative. It's fun to interview the people mm -hmm. I interview for my books. Um, uh, I, I like not having a boss. I like being in charge of my own schedule. I like people uh, not telling me what I have to do. Mm. Uh, so there are a lot of trade-offs. And yeah. Uh, yeah, it's hard work, but you know, it's nice to kind of know what you're going to do every day for mm. a number of years. Yeah. And Bill, how would you say that writing this book changed you? Yeah, I don't, I don't know the answer to that. Uh, I don't know. Uh, you know, I know that generally speaking, uh, uh, it's clear that, um, you know, I was meant to be a, a writer, um, uh, that I'm much happier as a writer than I was as a banker. You know, I used to say about banking, uh, it was good one day a year. Uh, you know, the year you got your bonus, the day you got your bonus. <laughs> so uh, all the other days really stunk. Uh, and, uh, you know, uh, you talk about uh, hard work, uh, a lot of make work, a lot of uh, uh, ambitious, uh, avaricious people uh, telling you what you had to do because they said you had to do it, uh, you know, ruining your you know, uh, weekends and your nights, your family life. Uh, you know, this is far a much better life. You know, I don't get paid as much uh, sometimes, but, uh, you know, it's a, it's a great trade-off because, you know, how, What's it worth to be able to have, you know, basically complete control of your time and your life and what you do every day and being able to spend time with your family or go on vacations, you know, without somebody, you know, chasing you down and driving you nuts and uh, and ruining it. Being, yeah. And and and, and pe people, you know, you know, stealing your time and your uh, your capital, your intellectual capital and your equity, you know, now I, you know, if, if a book works and people like it and they buy it, uh, you know, that's, that's, that's my equity, my brand, my, you know, uh, you know, my goodwill. And if it, if it doesn't work out, then that's my, my blame, my fault, mm -hmm. my problem. Uh, so I like it. Yeah. 
Well, I just want to thank you for taking the time to go back through it, you know, after having our first interview talking about, and for those people that want to, you know, uh, visit back to Bill's first discussion we had, that's episode 739, where you talked about your worst investment ever. But, you know, it's great going through this book, Power Failure, The Rise and Fall of General Electric. It is an amazing book. I highly recommend it for the listeners and viewers out there. I'll have links in the in the show notes and, uh, you know, just amazing. I, maybe I'll leave you with the last word. Is there any, any last message that you want to get across in relation to the book or, you know, what, what you're thinking? Uh, I just think, uh, you know, I try to write books that I like to read, uh, that, that, that have great characters and great stories. And yes, it's a long book. Uh, but I think it's a great story and worth your time. It's worth it for sure. Uh, again, thanks a lot. And for listeners and viewers, viewers out there, I will see you on The Upside.